Good morning, I'm John Bowers. I'm director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency. I'm very glad to open the uh, 2013 uh, Summit on Energy Efficiency. It's uh, really a delight to have all of you here, and it's a very exciting set of two days of, of speakers, and uh, I think we're all going to be uh, learning a lot. Our goal at the Institute for Energy Efficiency is leading a future for a sustainable energy. And we've seen a lot of progress in our country in, in becoming energy efficient. And uh, we're, I think, in a much better position now than we were five years ago. And uh, I think we're much better in terms of efficiently getting there and, and not consuming our, our meager resources. Our goal is a future where energy is used efficiently and waste is minimized, a future where conflicts over scarce energy resources do not dominate the, the political climate, and a future in which we live in equilibrium with the natural resources of our planet and ensure that they are available for subsequent generation. The path we envision relies heavily on investment in science and engineering for new solutions. And this is something our first speaker, Steve Chu, at the Department of Energy has very much uh, envisioned and, and driven. Um, we created the Institute for Energy Efficiency specifically to address the need for efficient application. About six years ago, we've made a lot of progress to make that a reality. At the research review yesterday for the industrial partners, we outlined a bunch of the recent research over the past year. And uh, we'll see some of that in some of the later talks today. But I'd like to highlight three examples of, of cases where investment in research has had significant advances. One is in the area of LED lighting. Obviously, there have been huge improvements in energy efficiency of, of LEDs. But the big problem has been for lighting, uh, they're much less efficient than, than low level, low intensity level uh, LEDs. And that problem of droop uh, has been the big issue, and we focused a lot of research on it, and uh, specifically funded by the Department of Energy EFRC. And about two years ago, Chris Vanderwall and his group predicted that the reason for this droop was something that was relatively unexpected, an indirect OJ effect. And that was surprising because OJ tends to dominate in small band gap semiconductors, but not large band gap semiconductors. And uh, the really exciting thing is about a week ago, uh, Claude Weisbooth here and, and Jim Speck published the first experimental verification of OJ processes in any semiconductor, but in particular in gallium nitride. And so now that this has been identified as, as the dominant, or at least we think it's the dominant uh, limitation, you can now engineer around that. You can design quantum wells to, to eliminate that. And I think we'll see significant improvements in efficiency after that. A second example is in the polymer solar cell work. Uh, Alan Heger, as you know, has led this work and, and won a Nobel Prize for, for conducting polymers. And uh, after getting the EFRC, uh, he and Guy Bazan and uh, other professors in that group sat down and looked at, at specifically what could they do that was different than before. And they invented the small molecule approach. And small molecules self-organize more efficiently than the larger polymers that had been used before. And they're now getting world record efficiencies. And there's lots of groups around the world and even conference focused just on these small molecules. So that's a, a second good example of research that's come out of, of institutes like this. Um, the final one, um, about six years ago, we invented and demonstrated the hybrid silicon laser together with Intel. And uh, later today in the session on ICT, you'll hear Mario Paniccia uh, of Intel talk about their commercialization of this process and deployment in data centers and the first high volume manufacturing of something that was just an idea six years ago. So it's, a, it's another example uh, of this. This research has been getting a lot of recognition. Um, and uh, one example is the Leiden University rankings that came out uh, recently. And uh, on a worldwide ranking of the top 500 universities, UCSB was ranked number two in science and engineering for citation impact uh, in the world. So we're very, very proud of that. I'm very grateful for the leadership of our directors council. Um, it's, they're you know, composed of the captains of industry, and, and I think most of you here know them. Um, Jeff Henley, chairman, former CFO of Oracle. Dan Burnham, former CEO of Raytheon. Uh, George Holbrook, CEO of Bradley Resources. Michael Tobes, chairman of Montecito Bank, uh, and others. 
And actually, I'd like to digress a moment and, and celebrate something that I only saw yesterday, um, which was uh, an email. Uh, the College of Engineering and the Technology Management Program sponsor an award annually, uh, the Venki Narayana Murthy Entrepreneurial Leadership Award, and uh, that recognizes uh, people who've shown, obviously, le led startups and, and, and so forth. And uh, this year's selection is a member who's been involved in 78 startups, either as founder, CEO, or investor, and as a member of the famous Band of Angels, and there's a number of, of that group here. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm proud, actually, to say that the uh, selection, which is selected by a group of, of CEOs, uh, uh, is George Holbrook. So let's congratulate George. I would like to thank the sponsors of the summit, um, and they're posted here uh, around the room. The gold sponsor, Southern California Edison. They've been involved in, in many aspects, research as well as, as financial sponsorship. Silver uh, supporters, Corning, which recently had a big announcement on a new uh, high bendable low loss optical fiber. Um, Stradling Yoka, Carlson and Routh, attorneys for many of the startups in town, Yardi. Transform is a supporting sponsor. They're sort of the poster child for efficient power conversion. Our lead media sponsor is Pacific Standard. Hopefully you saw a lot of their ads in their magazines. Um, South Coast Business Times has been uh, reporting on, in fact, recently had an issue on, on energy efficiency and our other media partners. I'd also like to thank our industry partners uh, for their ongoing support and involvement in the research here. Uh, Southern California Edison, PG&E, United Technologies, Sony, Bloom Energy, Ecomerit, Hewlett Packard, and Calient. A couple housekeeping notes. Um, this is designed as a uh, panel session with the moderator and panelists. We'll say a few words first. We really do want you to ask questions and, and get involved rather than just have presentations. And there will be microphones at the front and uh, please come up and, and uh, ask your uh, questions, but we do want involvement of the audience very much in, in this uh, uh, summit. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce Vice Chancellor for Research, uh, Mike Witherall, former director of Fermilabs, to uh, wel welcome you. Michael. So thank you. I would like to welcome everyone to Santa Barbara for this version of the Summit on Energy Efficiency, Materials for a Sustainable Energy Future. As, as Vice Chancellor here, I have the opportunity to tell people something about our university. Uh, and the short story is that in a relatively short time, we have developed one of the leading research institutions in engineering and science. You heard about from John about the ranking in the, by the Leiden University, but uh, also, the National Research Council, ranking our graduate programs, ranked all five of the departments in the College of Engineering in the top eight in the country, and the physics department as well. This is a remarkable achievement in such a short time. Several years ago, when we looked at how to apply our strength in science and engineering to the grand challenge of energy, it became clear that our focus should be on technology for energy efficiency and especially on developing materials that could transform that technology. Most of the technologies require new materials, and the top-ranked materials department in the country is UCSB, and it's one that connects with all of the relevant departments on the campus. So this is what brought us today, so I want to give special credit to John Bowers and Dave Austin for taking the Institute of Energy Efficiency and executing that vision that many people had. And I would like to take one minute just to celebrate the most recent honor to come to UCSB. I just came back from the 150th meeting of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, President Obama talked to us on Monday. Uh, Tuesday, we elected our new members, and at that meeting, Galen Stuckey was elected to the Academy for his broad and deep contributions to chemistry and materials. So Galen, I saw coming in over there, so stand up, Galen. Congratulations. <laughs> This has actually been a good, good time for Galen. He was awarded a $1.6 million grant from RPE for some new energy storage technology recently, and he's going to be talking about that later at this meeting. 
So with that, I will, I'll just say, uh, have a great meeting. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and welcome to Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Rod Alfernes, the Dean of Engineering at UCSB, who will introduce the uh, plenary speaker. Thank you, John. I would just li like to take one moment to, on behalf of the College of Engineering, welcome you to this uh, UCSB summit. At UCSB, we believe that our mission includes the leveraging of discoveries and inventions of our faculty and students to address the challenging issues facing society. And we furthermore believe that partnering with other universities, government agencies, and with industry is essential to bring our enabling science and technology out of the lab and into innovative products and services that improve people's lives and enhance the economic well-being of the nation. And this summit, I believe, brings energy thought leaders from all of those areas together to share progress, explore new ideas, and to challenge each other in this critically important field. And as Mike has pointed out, the topic for this year of materials in that role is particularly um, appropriate given the, the huge stature of our materials science and engineering here at UCSB. So I, I look forward to an exciting and, as John has indicated, a very interactive summit. <laughs> And now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Stephen Chu. For the last four years, Steve has served as the 12th United States Secretary of Energy in President Obama's administration. Steve has now stepped down from that role and returned to Stanford University as a professor of physics and molecular and cellular physiology. And prior to his cabinet post, Steve was director of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and a professor at UC Berkeley and before that at Stanford. Before these positions, Steve was with AT&T Bell Laboratories where he performed his pioneering work on laser cooling and trapping of atoms for which he was co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. And I might add on a personal note, having played softball with Steve, that his passion and energy on the softball diamond matched that in the lab. As, as the first scientist to head DOE, Steve recruited a team of other accomplished scientists and engineers to address the sustainable energy challenge and, he, and to bring a new sense of leadership driven and guided by science and understanding of technical issues to the leadership of DOE. During his tenure as secretary, the Department of Energy began the Energy in Innovation Hubs, the Clean Energy Ministerial, and several other initiatives that effectively doubled the deployment of renewable energy in the US. Perhaps the most innovative of these areas was ARPA-E, um, which you've just heard about, and, and congratulations, Galen. Um, and its purpose um, is to nurture high-risk, high-reward energy technologies that offer the promise to completely change the energy landscape of the U.S. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Steve Chu. All right, thank you, Rod. Um, this is an experiment because uh, it's the first time I've done a presentation on a Mac. So I guess I just pushed the button, so it shouldn't be that big an experiment. Um, all right, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. I, I just want to get on with it. And uh, first, before I get into the meat of the talk, I want to say that uh, it's about materials and innovation in materials, but you should not separate materials from the manufacturing uh, processes, because that's really what, what ultimately will matter, and also the system and device design. Again, uh, it's an integrated engineering approach that really will make uh, the best inroads. And so it's that you theme that you should always remember. So I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of topics, four topics if I have time. Uh, LED materials I uh, wisely omitted because that's like bringing coals to Newcastle. Probably should have omitted photomotaic materials, but never mind. <laughs> um, first, let me start with uh, 
high strength lightweight materials for transportation. Um, these new materials and the way you can manufacture them really can transform the landscape. And let me give you an example. Uh, this is, of course, the Washington Monument. Um, I don't know how many people know uh, that it is uh, capped with a precious metal. Uh, and what is that precious metal? Uh, you can guess. We don't have clickers, so uh, I'll tell you. It's aluminum. You say, what? How can the father of our country, the monument to the father of our country, be capped in aluminum? And w that's not a precious metal. Well, uh, in 1884, the price of aluminum was about a dollar an ounce, and the price of gold was $20 an ounce. Uh, compare that to the average wage of the highest skilled craftsperson uh, working on the monument, they, they were being paid $2 a day. So it's half a day's wages for the highest skilled craftsman to cap this thing in aluminum. Nowadays, because of different processing, aluminum is about six cents an ounce. Ironically, gold is around 1776 an ounce, <laughs> plus or minus a couple hundred dollars. Um, so the question is, what happened? And what happened with aluminum is there was an electrolytic refining process. In one fell swoop, uh, you can get very, very pure aluminum. And the question is, can you do this with titanium? And in the conventional titanium method, you take titanium dioxide, which is almost as abundant as aluminum oxide uh, and iron oxides, and you convert it to uh, 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 titanium tetrachloride, you reduce it, and then you remelt it three times. And this is remelt three times at uh, 1660 degrees C. Hugely energy intensive. You do need this three times for aircraft quality aluminum. So the real question is, can you actually get an electrolytic breakdown and refinement just in one fell swoop like aluminum? There's a DARPA project uh, investing in this, and the benefits well be in terms of the primary energy use. Uh, the old coal method um, would use nine times the amount of projected savings of five times, nine times the energy. And then the product of this would be also a not only structural material, but a titanium powder that can uh, be used in additive manufacturing. So what's additive manufacturing? Well, it's a laser that's focusing intense beam or set of beams onto titanium powder. And where it's focused, it actually melts the powder. And so by controlling where this beam is in three dimensions and in time, you can build structures. This is an example of a structure you can build of powder titanium uh, with a computer controlled laser. Uh, so this is an articulated hand holding a ball within a ball within a ball within a ball within a ball. All the balls are movable. You can, you can make these structures now in additive machining. Uh, the titanium would go a long way to making uh, these titanium parts additive machining. Okay, it could really transform things. Airplanes have become very efficient. Uh, the Boeing 787, when it flies, uses only about 30% of the fuel as a 707C. When I was in government, I can't say that. <laughs> um, but it is uh, a fabulously efficient airplane. It's due to a number of things, uh, improved aerodynamics, engines, materials. Um, materials, okay, the wings and now part, major parts of the fuselage are carbon composite. Uh, very expensive to make. Not only it, it, it's essentially handmade, if you will, and then it's put in an oil clave where you bake it in a, part, a pretty good vacuum. So the question is, um, can you get it out of the oil clave? If you can get it out of the oil clave, very much larger parts can be made at much lower cost in carbon fiber. Now, I also, you see at the bottom here, is it possible to make carbon composites that can be molded as the thermoplastics? Well, there's already a hybrid. You make a, a flat sheet of a carbon composite, and you heat it up, and you stamp it. And we make our military helmets this way now. But the real dream I have, and so please, someone take notes and listen and try to do this, is to take um, high aspect ratio carbon, not, if not nano, microtubes, but some, maybe a fraction of a micron in, in diameter with tens or maybe 100 microns long, with the ends treated. You can injection mold those into any form you want, and then you want to initiate some chemistry to link the carbon rods together. You should get 80, maybe 90%, maybe 75% of the strength, but now it becomes cheap. It becomes injection molded, which would again transform how you make composite materials. 
Before, it's sheets and fibers. You layer it out, you put it, uh, essentially epoxy-like material on it, and you flatten it. If you can do this in all in one fell swoop, again, you're in a completely different place. Since um, I'm going to be followed uh, by um, a uh, representative from Pratt Whitney slash UTC, uh, Mike McQuaid. I'm not going to talk about all the great things one can do with engines, but uh, I just want to mention briefly the turbine blade materials have had great progress. The first five sets of progress where you have, starting with crystals that get to be more or less the same size, oriented crystals, single crystals, single crystals, tail, tailored configurations. Today's modern jet plane turbine blades are single crystals actually grown in this tailored configuration. And because of that, they're very strong and they can get much higher temperatures. The higher the temperatures, uh, the better the performance of the plane. And it's going to be marching towards a ceramic matrix composites and other things like that. But uh, I think Mike will tell you more about that. Lowly steel. Uh, there has been progress made in steel, but there should be much more progress made in steel. Um, this is a plot of the steels used in a lot of things in construction and automobile manufacturing. Vir until maybe a couple of years ago, virtually all the steel used in U.S. car manufacturing was uh, carbon, low strength, low tensile strength carbon steel. Uh, the Europe and Asia went to a higher tensile strength steels, but how high is higher tensile strength? We're talking about Instead of 200 or 150 megapascals, we're talking about 600, 800, 1,000 megapascals. Okay, so these high tensile strength steels mean that you can make a much lighter weight structure that can protect the passenger, would not be crushable, and yet uh, be much stronger. And so it's these, these uh, conventional, unconventional steels that uh, uh, have great promise. Now, who are the ma major manufacturers of the unconventional steels? Well, seals, well, there's Alcor Mittel, there's Severstall, there's Sison Krupp. Where are they? India, Russia, Germany. U.S. is not a player, a real serious player in the most advanced steels. Okay, now, this is a very complicated diagram. I don't expect you to read it. It comes in three columns. The first column called processing is shake and bake. A shake, bake, and pound. <laughs> and it's a, you take the steel, you want to make a samurai sword, you, you, you pound it, you shake it, you pound it again, things of that nature. Then what you find is, uh, and you, these steels have impurities, and the, the newer steels have uh, doped impurities, vanadium, chromium, all sorts of goodies at very, very small fractions, 1%, half a percent, tenth of a percent. And what you find today is after you've done these processing steps, you find that there's a microstructure and a mesostructure and a nanostructure that gives the, all, all the properties that you'd like, whether it be strength or high tensile strength or toughness or resistance uh, to corrosion. So those are the things, you, but there's no fundamental understanding of how to predict what processes will give you and, and what impurities will give you the qualities of steel. So, Nowadays, we have uh, incredible diagnostics, electron microscopy, uh, x-ray, neutron, and scanning probe microscopy, so you get to peer uh, as you're doing it in a very fast turnaround time. But the most important thing that has only begun to uh, take place is to use computational tools. Right now, we use computational tools to, to figure out interfacial boundary energies, essential chemical equilibrium issues, things of that nature. But in a lot of the processing, oh, by the way, all these alloys are essentially metastable. Sometimes they're a very long time scale, so it's essentially stable. But it's in this processing that you need dynamics, and so we don't really have equilibrium equations that we can play. So there's a huge advantage in uh, doing some simulations, and the simulations will then enable you to, well, accelerate by, if not centuries, at least decades, the processing in the steps. So that's a huge opportunity. Now let me move on to materials for power electronics, and also include generators and motors. <clears throat> now, if you look at uh, today's substations and power plants, you find something, uh, you find transformers that uh, Edison and Westinghouse and especially Tesla would recognize of 100 years ago. 
uh, they, there's not much difference, a fundamental difference in those transformers. Uh, Tesla used paper as an insulator and a spacer for the uh, copper tubes dunked in oil. We still do. So uh, there's a, and actually, when you use paper for the spacers, it's oil resistant. But again, you have to bake it in a, sort of an autoclave in a vacuum to, for acid, uh before you put in the oil to get all, all the moisture and all these other things. Okay. So even something like that, uh, there's an, a, a crying need for new materials. But the other thing to remember is that, roughly speaking, this is not a law of physics, but more an engineering law. The higher the frequency you step up and step down, uh, the smaller the size of the transformer or converter or inverter. So if you go from uh, 60 hertz to 60 kilohertz, you roughly can gain a factor of 1,000 in length scale. All right? So, so that's wh what we mean by this pictorial, uh, and where you add a little bit more extra uh, wiggle room, but from 10,000 pounds to 100 pounds, but a lot smaller. The point here is that as we go into the future, most of uh, the electricity will go through power electronics, excluding the 60 hertz transformers. And so this is, uh, we need materials for these power electronics. Uh, silicon is the material of the present day, but uh, there's a lot of emphasis on trying to get manufacturable, lower cost, wide band gap materials. The wider the band gap, uh, the higher the breakdown voltage, you can go to higher power, higher voltage, all sorts of good things. And so <clears throat> uh, Department of Energy, we've been supporting work in silicon carbide and also gallium nitride. Where are we? Well, uh, here's now, uh, I think it's two transistors and two diodes, a package. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, on the left-hand side is, is the module, and you open up the lid, and what it is is uh, 1.2 kilovolts and 880 amps, about a megawatt, and something uh, size of a, a pack of cards. Uh, it's getting better. We now have, a, at least on the lab bench, uh, a one megawatt single silicon carbide transistor. Now getting this big the size of your thumbnail. Okay, this is gonna be a big time boost to a lot of things from uh, plug-in hybrids, EVs, to the uh, converters and inverters you need for inexpensive DC uh, transmission. <clears throat> In addition to the wideband gap electronics, we would need some uh, magnetic materials, both hard and soft. That is to say, electromagnetic material where it can flip, uh, the spins can flip very rapidly on this kilohertz or tens of kilohertz time scale, and hard permanent magnets uh, for more, more efficient motors. Well, just to remind you of high school physics or electrical engineering, uh, if you have a magnet that you want, to, electromagnet you want to flip back and forth very quickly, there are two things you're worried about. One is that as you're flipping this back and forth, you're, forth, you're inducing uh, electrical currents. These so-called eddy currents are lossy. They're mechanical designs, layered of materials to uh, stop that, to decrease that. But if you had a material that has intrinsically poor electrical conductivity, you're better off. The other thing is that you want to flip the spins of the atoms in the material but you don't want to change the domain walls. The changing of the domain walls and the domain wall creeping around while you're flipping is very, very lossy. And so you just want the domain walls to be fixed, but the spins to be flipping. Uh, there are some inroads in that. Uh, in fact, the Department of Energy sponsored a research program in the 1990s that essentially did a, what's called splat cooling. You get a metallic material, you cool it very rapidly, it splats on a surface and conducts away, and you make a metal glass. Uh, this stuff is about 85% more efficient than your standard silicon uh, iron magnet material. Now, the sad thing about this is Union Carbide didn't have the staying power. They, they got it, and the company was bought out by uh, a foreign company. Okay. And it's even more sad because in the Department of Energy, we do appliance and uh, efficiency stands for lots of things, including telephone pole transformers and transformers like that. But heavy lobbying, since uh, the only manufacturer of the really good stuff is foreign, we are not allowed to up the standard to use the good stuff. So um, something to think about. Uh, permanent magnets, uh, great strides from the 1920s to uh, today. 
on improved uh, magnets. Uh, some of these now permanent magnets are unbelievable. If you get a little sample of this, a little button, it can ruin any watch it comes near. <laughs> and uh, so this magnetization, th there's a couple of qualities of the magnetization, higher temperature, uh, 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 coercivity, it has to be, remain as a permanent magnet, it has to be, more, the more anisotropic the magnet is, the better, the more you can control the magnetic fields, things of that nature. But the trouble with rare earth magnets is that they're very expensive, in large part because China uh, produces and controls over 95% of the production of materials for the magnets and also for the LEDs. So, uh, we're trying to figure out better designs. One idea that is working at least in the lab scale on a small scale is you have a mixture of the good permanent magnet surrounded by a soft magnet, but the permanent, uh, but on a mesoscale, so that the permanent magnet induces the magnetism of the soft magnet, so it's a larger volume permanent magnet, and still has the uh, coercivity and, and, and uh, its uh, permanence in terms of uh, magnetic field stability. So that's one approach of what we call uh, scalable exchange coupling uh, to mesoscale instead of an atomic scale. And then there are other totally different materials like business manganese on iron or things like that, which again could um, be as good or better than the uh, permanent rare earth magnets we have. Let me move on to photovoltaic materials and processes. Um, most engineering develop follows what's either called a Moore's law or a learning curve. It usually follows a learning curve. A learning curve means that on the x-axis you have production. When you, every time you increase cumulative production by an order of magnitude, the cost of manufacturing goes down by a certain fraction, let's say 10 or 20 percent. Another order of magnitude goes down by another 20 percent or 30 percent, so on. Moore's law is the x-axis on time. It works for fewer things, like the density of computer chips, uh, but this is typically what happens, is the so-called learning curves. Therefore, it's a power law of cost equals product made and shipped to some power. Um, and so on the blue, you have a crystalline silicon cost of uh, photovoltaic modules, starting at something like over $20 per watt, if 20, a watt is a standard illumination. Marching down, that bump you see uh, around 10,000 units is um, a very generous feed-in tariff subsidy from Germany, so it created a huge demand and, and it created a shortage. And then there is an exuberant uh, abundance of investment, uh, thinking that many countries will go there, but then the recession hit. And um, so instead of the 2015 prediction being where it was, we now have in April 2013, I looked this up last night, the spot market price for a silicon module is about 69 cents. It used to be $4 four years ago. Um, and so right now, because of this, there's a huge shakeout in the silicon manufacturing market. A lot of things are coalescing, many are going bankrupt. Uh, Hopefully that will stabilize for a year or two, but after that it will follow the same learning curve because there's so much technological headroom. Uh, the green one is thin film CAD telluride. I am not going to tell you about all the types of new approaches to photovoltaic manufacturing, new materials, multi-layers, all these other things. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about don't ever count silicon out. <laughs> uh, and so right now in a silicon module that you buy anywhere around the world, Half the cost is the polysilicon. Before you've doped it, before you've done any of the uh, uh, lithography for the electrodes or anything, it's just the polysilicon. And so, uh, and right now what you do is you saw it up and you cut it into wafers about 150 microns thick, but you can't get much finer than that. You don't need that. Even though it's indirect band gap material, you can have light trapping techniques, you can get away with 30 microns, maybe even less. So one, so the conventional approach, as you see in the upper part of this, is you have this big blob of polysilicon, you, you cut it up into bricks, uh, you grind and polish it, you saw into those wafers. Uh, this is, um, one approach is um, being uh, explored by a company called 1366. You essentially take a plate in molten silicon, you dip it in, you lift it off, you tilt it, and the silicon runs off, leaving an adjustable 
layer. And um, right now, I think they're up to uh, a wafer efficiency of something like 16 or 17 percent efficiency. So it's actually very high quality silicon, but it's now you're using one quarter of the material. Uh, and it may even be possible uh, to, to make this single crystal. Um, oh, yeah, that's uh, the 1366 is a conception of how to teach it to the public. It's like dipping uh, strawberry into white chocolate. <clears throat> uh, there could be other lift-off techniques on a, a flexible substrate, again, 30, 35 microns thick for companies like Selectrol. And here's one last uh, idea that is being pursued by a couple groups that I know of. Um, this one uh, by ZX Chen, uh, Milosh, and their collaborators. And it fundamentally goes as follows. In silicon photovoltaic material, you want uh, very high intensity sunlight concentrating because the higher the intensity sunlight, uh, the more efficient it gets. However, the higher intensity sunlight, uh, you have a heat loading problem. The hotter it gets, you have all sorts of uh, collisions of the carriers with phonons. So that's bad. So what these guys said is, why not combine the best of both? And it's a hybrid, what you call photon enhanced thermionic emission. In an old style vacuum tubes, you heat something up to red hot and electrons come off. Now you let the photons supply a good fraction of that energy plus the heat and electrons come off and they get attracted to the cathode. Okay, this, now, this is, wait, I don't want a vacuum tube. No, 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 this is nanofabricated stuff. So the vacuum is in the material. And so uh, they've recently, I think, got 2% conversion efficiency out of, you know, they, got, they were very exciting because they, they leapt forward by two orders of magnitude, and they are confident they can get to 20% conversion efficiency. But remember, this works well at high temperatures, uh, and so uh, it can be work on utility-scale solar concentrating power plants as well. So, and again, a, a very innovative approach. Now, the comparison between single crystal and polycrystalline is uh, like night and day in terms of the cost. And in the right in the right hand solution, you have this big bulk. That's a sample of polycrystalline. <clears throat> They're grown in vats this big, uh, melted and purified, and you get these polycrystalline. But if you cool and anneal very very carefully, this uh, you can get directional solidification, and you can get a half, two-thirds of that polysilicon actually to be single crystal. And so this is something, again, the Department of Energy supported, uh, BP Solar in the United States. Uh, they're now, that's a sample of some of the uh, directional solidification that made uh, a silicon uh, cell that had 20% efficiency as, you know, within one or two percent of the best commercial grade stuff, non-space commercial grade stuff. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, BP uh, America didn't have staying power. They sold the rights to a small company in Germany, and now China's developing this, and then we're looking into trying to defend some of these patent rights. But again, uh, the innovation started in America, but it didn't stay, the manufacturing did not stay in America. Okay. Energy storage materials. Where's my timer? Oops. Okay. Um, it says I only have 20 minutes left. Never, never mind. <laughs> uh, lithium, there's lithium ion, lithium air batteries. Uh, this slide was made about a year and a half ago. You see, uh, you know, two figures of merit are the energy in uh, uh, watt hours per kilogram and also the number of watt, the power in watts per kilogram. And uh, it's already out of date because advanced lithium is, not, is uh, over uh, 300 watt hours per kilogram. It's pushing 400 and above. Um, there's even more things uh, afoot here to go well above 400 um, watts per kilogram. But it, I stress that this is only one of about five critical figures of merit. Uh, high temperature bulletproof operation is another one. Uh, so you can park your car in a Phoenix uh, 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 parking lot exposed to the sun for a week and you don't come back with a, a really dead battery, uh, things of that nature, and uh, cyclability. Uh, 5,000 would be a minimum, but you'd really want maybe 8,000 to give you 15-year uh, moderately deep discharge uh, cycles uh, for 15 years would require about 8,000 
cycles. <clears throat> but the materials isn't the only thing. It turns out the materials are better than the batteries because you back way off from the ability of the materials to perform because of safety issues, longevity issues. Now, for example, uh, if you, right now in our current batteries that are being sold commercially, we measure the voltage, the current, and the temperature, but it's the outside temperature. If you begin to measure the inside parameters, you can charge much more quickly. You can use, instead of half the battery, which is, for example, the level being used in a Chevy Volt or Nissan Leaf type car, you can go to maybe two thirds and still have the same lifetime. Uh, if you use a computer battery, you should not be discharging to 85% the way they, because if you do, you lose about a third to half of the capacity of that battery within a year. You probably noticed that. Uh, but, and so in some computers, they allow you to adjust it so, so by the time you get to 25% or 30% of full discharge, you stop. Okay, if you want the full discharge and go to 5, 15%, you can have it, but your battery won't be there a year from now. So anyway, so sensing. One example of sensing, and uh, I'll skip the other examples, is this is the fiber, and you have a Bragg grating in the fiber. And then as the dimensions of the fiber change, you get more or less reflected light. You, since it's a little teeny fiber, you can stick the fiber in the battery pack itself. It turns out that can be used to sense temperature. It can be used to sense chemicals on the fiber, anything that changes the transmission properties of the fiber. And then you can do multiple bandwidths of cheap infrared uh, lasers. It doesn't have to be now band. It can be just broadband. Okay. So this is, again, something very inexpensive. Sensors like that inside the battery will help a lot. Uh, oh, I'll do one more. Um, this is the temperature on the outside, the dotted line is the temperature of the outside of the battery pack, and this is the temperature of the anode and cathode. You can actually measure the temperature by putting a fairly low frequency test signal into the battery across the two, the plus and minus, and the change in the frequent, the phase shift of the frequency coming back out is actually tells you the temperature of the battery and it's surprisingly consistent with a given battery manufacturing across batteries, batteries, batteries. And so again, because it's just low frequency, you know, like a few hundred hertz, very inexpensive electronics, again, tells you what the temperature of the battery is uh, internally in the battery. So it would be a great help. So let me conclude by saying New materials are a great enabler uh, of these new technologies. New materials coupled with better systems design would even be a better enabler. But the other thing is that we can not only invent things at, in America, we have to be made in America. And that's the scariest thing that I am concerned because we have all these lovely inventions. We have proof of principle. We have startup companies that seem to work. And then a foreign company comes in, swoops up, and buys it. Uh, and so we've got to figure this one out. Thank you. Do <clears throat> I go? Stay? Dave? All right. See you again. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll, I'll do a couple of questions, and then um, I think I'll just <coughs> open it up for the general audience to, to, to ask you questions. So um, a, a number of people, um, Bill Gates, Jeff M. Holt, John Doerr, uh, myself, and lots of others, I think have come to the realization that in terms of all the money, subsidies, all that stuff are being spent, it might be better to, to re-proportion re that, all that, and, and like triple the amount of research that's being done and funded by the government in universities and the labs and that sort of thing, uh, because it, it, it would potentially hasten, you know, great, great innovation, all that kind of stuff that you're talking about. So what do you think the chances are, having presided over some of this rationing of money and that sort of thing, that we maybe could um, reapportion money and, and maybe triple basic research? Well, first, let me, before I say that, let me violently agree with you uh, <laughs> and all the others on, on, um, on the, uh, the reapportionment of money, because, because it's the basic research and development, it, which is really breaking through frontiers and creating the really new technologies, is very important. The closer you get to either demoing and especially in deployment, the more I feel that uh, that should be more and more, if not 100% of private sector investment, especially at deployment level. Right. Um, 
uh, in Department of Energy, when I got there, the lore was, oh, 50% uh, cost share for helping build a new factory for something. Uh, and I said, you know, the serious people don't actually want 50%. They'll take a third or a quarter. And so we should start to make this a policy, no more than a third, all federal, uh, and, and then you know, states pop out other things. Because it's, it's like um, in medical school, when you ask people to take a physics course and an organic chemistry course, it's kind of a weeding process. <laughs> so so if, if a, a company is willing to pay two thirds of the money, they're serious. And, and there, there's too many companies that say, if you pay 50% uh, or more, uh, they'll say fine. And so, so uh, on the deployment side, you're gonna have, and it, oh, by the way, it costs a lot more, you know, $100 million, $200 million in deployment, it can buy a lot of research. And so uh, I certainly think that the best way to spend those dollars is to shift it over into research. Universities, it could be startup companies, it could be even big companies, but research and little bits of development. And again, as you go down uh, the food chain, uh, the, the government should st start to back off a lot. Now, what, is, what are the chances of doing this? Well, um, I don't know in all honesty, but I would say there are a number of people uh, on both sides of the aisle who recognize that that is the right thing to do. Um, but the, there's a countervailing um, push at work here that uh, I began, it took me three years to recognize this, having been in Washington four years, and that is, <clears throat> uh, uh, elected representatives like to be somewhere in their district and cut ribbons in front of a TV camera. It's a natural tendency. I'm not being cynical. Uh, you know, that, that helps show their, their, their voters what they're doing for their district. Uh, it's harder to cut a ribbon when it goes to this professor or, or that scientist, or something like that. And so, you know, it's small and dispersed and harder to understand than a new factory. And so that countervailing issue is something that I think the, uh, the public uh, should gently suggest and, and the private sector should gently suggest to the elected representatives that this is a better way to spend the money. But there are a reasonable number of people who actually agree with this, so it's not like you're starting from zero. Right, good. Well, I'm hopeful that people keep, more and more people start right. realizing this because it really, I think, will help. Another one is uh, natural gas. I think we've all come to realize in, just in the last few years how even though fracking has been going on a while, it's really, I think there's lots of articles, uh, the realization that this is a big deal. So how is this going to play in, in um, changing the, 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 the way things are done here and, 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 and potentially affecting some of the renewables things because the, the price of this right. stuff, at least today, is very, very cheap. Right. Uh, so fracking, uh, I, don't, I think it went, just recently went over $5, $4 a million BTU. Uh, it got as low as $250. Uh, below $350 or $4, uh, that's too low a price with today's technology to encourage further exploration and extraction. At $250 uh, and $3, uh, companies were shifting their rigs and going and looking for hydraulic fracturing of rock for oil, which is the, where the real money is. Um, but at four, five, six dollars, uh, it's going to drive the technology forward. The estimates of how much resources we have uh, vary wildly uh, by about an order of magnitude, but my guess would be at least 30, 40, 50 years of, of low, inexpensive gas prices. So, so it is beginning to change a lot of things. Um, Natural gas is now the chemical feedstock for all plas most plastics and uh, fertilizer, things of that nature. So the manufacturers like Dow will remain on shore because of this. Um, uh, electricity costs uh, generated by natural gas have gone way down. Uh, but again, but by the time you get to $4, it becomes a small fraction of, you know, at $8, $12 is the dominant factor. Um, so, and it's affecting transportation. One of the things that utilities are worried about, and as they should be, is that you should never put all your e energy eggs in one basket. 
And so already we're seeing a shift. There's, gonna, there's essentially no new coal plants being designed for a lot of reasons. And natural gas is, uh, in fact, wind is more, is cheaper than coal with all the stuff you have to put on coal today, let alone if we ever have a price on carbon. And so natural gas is, is undercut coal. Uh, it allows the utilities to start to retire some of the old inefficient coal plants that have been totally written off. Uh, it does, it has an impact on renewables, but I think it's temporary in that um, if you project what the EIA, this uh, autonomous part of the Department of Energy, projects what the cost of natural gas will be. In fact, even if you say it doesn't go over 6,000 million BTU, inflation adjusted, uh, renewables in, in one to two decades and energy storage could be comparable. So it's going to delay it a little bit, but it's not going to put it off forever. <coughs> Uh, because the energy storage and uh, the cost of renewables is still plunging and will continue for at least a decade or two. Uh, nuclear is taking a big hit because of this, um, uh, in part because of the huge upfront investment costs in nuclear and the uncertainty in the schedule, which then there's a premium on the cost of money for nuclear. So the, the biggest hits are actually not so much renewables as coal and nuclear. Uh, but again, it really depends on how these technologies develop. Now, the uh, hydraulic fracking technology is still rapidly improving. Uh, the good news is it, the safety part is also improving and it can be accelerated so that you have less risk uh, for fusion of emissions, less risk to water tables, things of that nature. So, so it, it's a very good transition fuel. Uh, hopefully, but we're going to need something by mid-century anyway, right. something different. Okay, great. So maybe take questions out here. Somebody wants to ask a question. Right, right down here. Stand up and use the mic. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Chu, thanks for this incredible presentation. It's fascinating stuff and a fascinating career you've had. Um, I can't think of anybody who, because of the dual nature of the science and the government side of this thing is better equipped to answer this question, which is this. We, this presentation is about what would happen in an ideal world. Um, what role should government play vis-a-vis -vis research, as an example. But we don't live in an ideal world. Um, we live in a world in which energy is dominated by the fossil fuel industry, and which, just to take an example, the oil companies employ more lobbyists than anybody else in the known universe. So you, now that you're out of government, perhaps you could speak to the realities of what it's going to take to get to where we all need to be, given the constraints of the real world. Well, I think um, there are one, it, it's actually, there's a strange dialogue that goes on, because there are many congressional hearings I've been at where they, they ask, well, I'm some sort of middle of the road would say, well, I'm for solar or I'm for wind, but you know, how long will these subsidies last? And I said, well, the, the wind industry, the, the, the OEA, says within 10 years, they can go away. Uh, actually shorter than 10 years. Maybe within five years, they can go away. Solar might need 10 years and then it can go away, A additional subsidy. Um, and so my usual response is, well, you know, oil and gas have had subsidy for 100 years. I think we should have renewables for 50 years when this, you start the clock in 1974-75, the first of oil shocks. So I think that's fair. <laughs> and make them all go to a level playing field. There are some, sub, you know, like oil depletion allowances, some sorts of subsidies that m much of the public isn't aware of. For example, there's something called uh, a master limited partnership. In a partnership, there's a small group of people get together, a uh, bunch of lawyers, a bunch of investors, and everything, and then there's no corporate entity. And so the income goes to the partners, and they pay their own separate individual income tax. There's a massive limited partnership, again, no corporate entity, but they go to a wider set of investors. Uh, wider set means you can actually buy shares in, for example, Morgan Kidder, a pipeline company. You and, well, I can now, I, when I was Secretary of Energy, I couldn't buy shares, but now I can buy shares and just, you know, on the open market, plunk down your money, and it's a pretty good deal. It's, uh, 
the last couple of years when the stock market was going like this, it was uh, averaging about 6 or 7% return. Uh, in the previous decade, it was averaging low double-digit returns, 10 12%. Okay. So massive limited partnerships are allowed for certain industries, oil, gas, coal, gas pipeline. That's it. Wouldn't it be nice if you have massive limited partnerships for renewables? Just to level the playing field. If you have massive limited partnerships for renewables and also REIT type things for renewables, that means a wider set of investors, including some institutional pension fund investors and you and I, which means are now can invest in this stuff, which means you have a wider base of investors, which means the cost of money goes down because of the cold competition. That will make a huge difference because the cost of money in renewable energy uh, is everything. You know, the fuel is free. And so it's the investment, the capital investment. So if you start looking at, at the edges where there are these funny subsidies and you, you level the playing field, I think that would go a long way to helping renewables. And now the reality is, <laughs> can this ever happen? Um, well, there is a chance that we can maybe get massive limit partnerships, uh, not this particular Congress, but you know, after the midterm election. Uh, there is a chance. Because you're arguing, uh, let's say the solar investment tax rate is 30%. If it goes down to 10% in five or 10 years, that wouldn't be catastrophic at all. The industry could live with that quite nicely. So, you know, you, everybody has a 10% investment tax credit. Instead of solar gas, to carve out for 30%. You get, you, so you can lower those things to what are called normal tax treatments, but you allow the fossil and the renewables to have the same tax treatments and all other things. That argument does actually have some resonance with both sides of the aisle. And so to argue that you know, it's more even-handed, and let's get to even-handed, and start making special this for this and special this for that. Yeah. Again, the technology is going rapidly, and so many people in the industry say, yeah, you know, decades or so, and we can be there. Makes sense. We're, we're going to run out of time, unfortunately. Oh, 10 minutes, so we'll make, take <clears throat> another question here. Right here. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Hi, Jeff. Henry Dubroff from Pacific Coast Business Times. Uh, one of the phenomena we've seen recently in our neck of the woods here is kind of distributed industrial scale uh, renewable and uh, alternative energy projects. They're creating some methane, they're generating some power. DOE put some money into an onion uh, reprocessing facility that's been an award winner. How much potential is there in locally based or regionally based uh, distributed systems that actually make uh, communities more efficient. And I could go on and talk about Ventura County right. agriculture and how globally competitive it needs to be, but do you see any hope there? And I did have one quick follow-up question. Uh, so very briefly, uh, there is a lot of hope. Uh, in certain places in the United States, it's already being deployed. In many con other countries, it is being deployed, especially countries that have a high cost of electricity either high cost of electricity or uh, some cost on carbon. Uh, and, and so, again, those things help. Uh, in parts of the United States where the cost of energy is very inexpensive, uh, let's say wholesale is six and a half cents a kilowatt hour, not in California, but there are places in the U.S. Uh, like that, it, it's harder. So, so, again, it depends on the state and, and the learning curve for all the technologies, not only uh, methane generation, but there's a whole distributed generation storage. When the battery prices, the battery prices have come down twofold in the last five years. Mm -hmm. uh, large batteries, like cars. Uh, they're gonna go down at least another twofold within five years. Our Department of Energy goals make them go down fourfold. Somewhere between three and fourfold, uh, all of a sudden the battery storage, and again, you need some other qualities, uh, coupled with s solar, especially, means you can actually, you know, you go to Costco, you buy this thing, $15,000, you get five kilowatt hours worth, 
you can do the low shifting. You, you know, the way our family uses electricity, we're 89% off grid, okay? And we're blackout immune. So, so, this, so nano generation is gonna be huge, uh, again, maybe a decade from today. We'll see, but, but again, the, the learning curves and the price reductions and everything are going rapidly in this direction. To this point, and, and to your earlier point, uh, one of our biggest strengths in this area, domestically from a manufacturing standpoint, has been a company called Power One, which is based in Camarillo, and until just this last week was a publicly traded US entity. It now has be agreed to be acquired by ABB uh, and will become a Swiss entity. Uh, what are the implications for this for US manufacturing? Um, because it distresses us parochially because we lose a $2 billion market cap company in our backyard, but globally it seems to have some big implications for U.S. competitiveness. Uh, yeah, that's just one of many, many examples of a small company going, 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 and it's merges. it looks like it's gonna work, and a big company swoops in, buys it up. It used to be bigger U.S. companies swoop and buy them up, right. uh, but it's increasingly being foreign companies. If you look at uh, power electronics in the world, transformers, generators, things like that, uh, around the last three or four decades, we've, we're, we're no longer in the market at all, Siemens, ABB, others. Now China and uh, Republic of Korea are, are, are trying to work their way into that market. So, so it goes to a lot of what has been happening over the last two decades uh, regarding uh, our economic base in the United States. There's a lovely article uh, written, uh, I think about a year ago, by Michael Spence uh, at Stanford uh, Business School, got a Nobel Prize. Um, in economics, or no, I shouldn't say Nobel Prize, a, a medal in the honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel, <laughs> because it wasn't in the original will. <laughs> uh, and, and he divided jobs into two types, tradable and non-tradable, and looked over about a, roughly a 20 year period from 1980 to 1991, uh, 2001, and, and in the, Tradable jobs, what's a tradable job? A manufacturing job. A car is a tradable sector because you can ship cars anywhere, appliances can be shipped anywhere, corn can be shipped anywhere, okay? Uh, those are tradable. A non-tradable, well, U.S. Secretary of Energy is non-tradable. <laughs> uh, you know, Minister of Energy in you know, England is non-tradable. Uh, restaurants, by and large, are, you know, except certain chains, but you know, the lo local jobs are non-tradable. Hospitals, teachers, things of that uh, largely are non-tradable. Uh, virtually all the job growth in that 20 year period in the United States was in the non-tradable sector. Every tradable sector went down except one, and that was financial services. <laughs> US which is somewhat tradable, right? We can teach other countries bad investment habits, <laughs> and uh, have, <laughs> and, and uh, that one went up, and the, all the others went down. This is disturbing, because that means in all the areas where we have to compete internationally, we are failing. And in those areas where we sell, you know, I sell you chocolates and you sell me pizza or you give me a haircut and I give you a hamburger. Uh, that's, all, that's all fine and good, except uh, you know, each country needs external inputs and outputs. <laughs> and and you know, going back to fundamental principles of physics, there's something missing here <laughs> if you're always buying but you're not selling, okay? That there's a conservation of wealth law at work here. And this has been happening for 25 years. So we have to wake up and say, what will it take in order to stop that from happening? Excellent. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. We could go on for, but again, thanks, this, was, this has been terrific. Okay, thank you.